Well, here we are again with the Virtual Boy, the Nintendo system that came out at the wrong time under the wrong circumstances. It's been a couple years since we last looked at the Virtual Boy, and since then, my collection of games for it has actually somewhat grown. Now, I feel that I should be talking about these games separately in a sequel to that core video. But until then, one other thing I'm surprised I didn't mention during that video is the dedicated fan community that the Virtual Boy still has. Given its tiny library and mystical nature from unused features to cancelled games, it's no surprise that a dedicated fan community has developed around it. They've done everything from building controller adapters and capture cards to recreating the unreleased link cable and patching games like Mario's Tennis to support it. And Planet Virtual Boy is a great website to keep track of all these efforts. Most notably, one of the more desired homebrew developments in the community is the Flash Cart. Mostly to run all types of homebrew software, but also because getting a hold of the entire Virtual Boy library is almost certainly going to cost a fortune. And many of these games are not legally available anywhere else, Nintendo missed their prime opportunity to do that. Throughout the early history of the Virtual Boy community, there has basically only been one Flash Cart produced, being the Flash Boy and its Plus variant. However, they can only hold one game at a time, and to change ROMs, you need to hook it up to specialized PC software every time, which isn't convenient despite the system's small library. So what we're looking at here today is a brand new Flash card created by one Kevin Mellot, a Virtual Boy enthusiast who's also done plenty of hardware projects for other VR systems. And what he came up with is possibly one of the most creative Flash cards I've ever seen. This is the Hyper Flash 32. Now, where do I begin? This is essentially still a single ROM flashcard and can only load one game at a time. There are no fancy EverDrive menus, though a separate flashcard that supports them is currently in the planning stages. But if you look around, there's still a micro SD slot on the top to put files into, and there's buttons on the back. So, to cut out the middleman of connecting to a PC to transfer files, Melot has decided to make the flashcard itself a self-contained user interface. Say hello to the e-ink display. This is ridiculous, and I love it so much. For those unaware, e-ink displays are what you'll commonly find on ebook devices like the Kindle. While having a terrible refresh rate, they quote-unquote stay on while consuming little to no power, and look almost exactly like ink on regular paper. Think of it as a digitally controlled Etch-a-Sketch. If you've never seen one in person, it kind of feels like magic. And this is actually my first time owning something with a display like this. So how does this work exactly? After preparing all the necessary files on the microSD card, you simply plug it in and connect the HyperFlash 32 to a micro USB power source. And the buttons on the back will now give off haptic feedback. Then you simply hold down both the A and B buttons on the sides, and there you go, it switches to a built-in ROM selection menu. You use the A and B buttons to select a ROM, then press the select button to flash it to the cartridge. Once that's done, it changes the display into a specialized label for the game you chose. And congratulations, you have now flashed your cartridge. When you unplug it, the screen will simply remain the way it was because that's how e-ink displays work. I'm gonna be honest here, it is an incredible engineering feat to fit all of this in the size of a Virtual Boy cartridge. And it's only slightly taller than one. My only real complaint design-wise is that it's missing the indent on official cartridges that allow you to pull the cartridge out from the system more easily. And one might say having a built-in display reflect what game is currently being loaded seems a bit excessive, but I just can't help but love this idea. These e-ink labels are fully customizable. You can prepare them through the specialized PC client, and plenty of members from the Virtual Boy community have already made their own sets of custom labels for the entire game library, ranging from a replica of the original cartridge designs like I have, or even fully original pixel art. The sky's the limit here. Well, that and four grayscale colors, which hasn't stopped the community from hosting label design competitions for the thing. Melot has even experimented with units that use a free color screen, but these aren't being used in mass production quite yet due to their price. Speaking of which, you may be wondering about that. As of this video, production of the Hyper Flash 32 cards come in several waves, the most recent one shipping on September for 200 US dollars per unit. Now, before you wince at that price, keep in mind that this is still a meticulously hand built piece of tech. And any serious Virtual Boy collector can tell you that $200 is nothing compared to the price of the rarest Virtual Boy games if you're looking to play them on actual hardware. And of course, you can also access unreleased games and homebrew software, which is what I'll be focusing on for the rest of this video. With the Virtual Boy's early demise, plenty of planned releases for the system have been scrapped. 
Some of the more notable ones include a traditional Mario platformer, an adventure game called Dragon Hopper, and even a rumored port of Donkey Kong Country 2. Of all these cancelled games, however, two of them have actually managed to see the light of day and can now be rediscovered on the actual hardware. The first game we're looking at can go by multiple names. Its Japanese exclusive name is Nico Chan Bato, but it's actually a port of a game called Faceball that also released on the Game Boy and Super Nintendo, and initially released on the Atari ST as Midi Maze. Faceball was probably the most descriptive title out of all three though, seeing as you play as a face who shoots balls at enemies in a maze. Kinda like Pac-Man crossed over with a first-person shooter. In each level, you wander around a maze and locate slash destroy all the enemies. Actually, the movement kinda feels like the old 3D maze screensaver you get in Windows 95. Is that too deep a reference? Oh yeah, you can also open a map that sticks right in your face like you can do on Windows 95. But yeah, each quote-unquote stage just consists of 14 levels, each with varying amounts of enemies. Ranging from the most basic, aptly titled Shot Me, to an assassin that follows you around, and even literal death. Some of them can also drop temporary power-ups and healing items. I put stage in quotes because no matter which stage you pick, it seems to send you through the exact same set of levels. So it's probably unfinished or just a bug. I do like the little maze exploration aspects with finding breakable walls and being able to see through transparent structures. It feels at home for the Virtual Boy. But the emulator footage you're seeing right now is definitely way smoother than the game can pull off on actual hardware. Not to unplayable levels, but it still leaves something to be desired. The gameplay does feel a bit more basic as it goes on, but it is totally worth it for the cast sequence at the end where each of the enemies gets something to say. Shot Me just begs you to shot him because he is a baka. Hydra is not messing around, they will straight up kill you. Ghost is just here, he's here to chill and have a good time. And now there's this unused enemy, a dark faceball called Dammy that just says Hee hee! While the game itself is obviously in an incomplete state, it would be remiss of me to not mention a hack released in 2013 which aims to complete it by adding new levels for the rest of the stages, restoring unused music and enemies, as well as adding modernized controls to allow for strafing. Pretty sick. Alright, moving on to the next game that is absolutely worth a mention in this video. Bound High was an action puzzle game developed by Japan System Supply for the Virtual Boy to be released in 1996. However, despite being completed, its release was cancelled because it was 1996. Which is a shame because it theoretically could have been a comeback title for the Virtual Boy. Even former Nintendo president Hiroshi Yamauchi called it a promising title. Which isn't an overstatement because this game is legitimately really good. How could you not be sold on this game already? The main story mode, Adventure of Chauvo, sees a city being attacked by forces from space. I feel like we've seen that plotline before. You play as the titular robot Chauvo, who can transform into a ball and bounce around stages defeating enemies. As you can see, the game plays from a top-down perspective to take advantage of the 3D effect, and it definitely helps things a bit. Some enemies can be defeated with a single jump, or you have to push them off the ledge and so on. The angle at which you land on enemies influences your direction, and different enemies and terrain you land on can change your momentum and bounce height. Add to that a whole bunch of hazards and power-ups that can paralyze you, make you bounce super high, or turn you into a big boy, and you've got a pretty engaging and challenging experience. Uh, guys, we gotta make this more challenging. I got it! I hate these guys. This game may be fairly simple on the surface, but it is most importantly pretty dang fun, plus something that actually feels tailor-made for the Virtual Boy, without pushing polygons past the system's limits or just adapting a simple 2D game over. There's even a side mode where you bounce balls into holes mini-golf style. Did I also mention that I want a sound test mode in this so badly because this soundtrack is a banger? dwell on it too long or spoil all of its surprises, but this is a game that is definitely worth giving a try. Which makes the fact that it never got officially released hurt just a little more. But if it is any consolation, this did not mark the end of our spherical hero Chauvo. 
Japan's system supply took the character plus some ideas from Bound High including parts of the soundtrack and reused them in Chaofu 55 for the Game Boy in 1997, where you can freely switch between robot and ball form to progress in the 2D puzzle platformer. Personally, I kinda prefer the more frantic arcade style of Bound High, but it's still cool to see that Chaofu wasn't ultimately forgotten. Well, I don't know how well the Game Boy game did, I'm assuming not much since it was 1997, so uh, <laughs> let's not get into that. Okay, I know we've kind of veered off track a little. I set out to make a video on a cool little flashcard and ended up almost spending the majority of the video on software instead. But still, I feel the need to talk about homebrew software for a bit, because while they aren't all noteworthy, there's still some technically impressive stuff in there. I'll try not to dawdle on each one for too long, so here we go! Blox is one of the very first Virtual Boy homebrew games, dating all the way back to 2003. Well, technically, the first ever homebrew game made was Virtual Pong in 1999, but that was coded to work with a specific Virtual Boy emulator and doesn't work on modern ones or the actual system. Eat instruction and precaution booklets before operating. Safety is important. Blox is basically Sokoban, the classic box pushing video game long before QB made it hip again. Given the source material, there isn't really much room for any 3D effects aside from the parallax background and UI elements. It's got that Fee Tetris problem going on. There's actually a story in here too, where we're introduced to the main character, Bob the Blob, but aside from it, it's pretty basic, there's not even any music. Which would be remedied in a sequel, Blocks 2, which basically improves on everything by adding an undo command, giving the playfield some actual dimension as well, and a save function, because there are so many dang level sets in this game. Fishbone is a game that I feel is partly inspired by Feeding Frenzy, you know, the game where you eat other fish and grow bigger and eat bigger fish. Except in this one, you just continuously eat smaller fish and never grow big, and the whole thing becomes an endless runner. I like the little animated sprites, but once again, there's not much 3D on display here besides the background. Though it's pretty cool that there are four different level themes to choose from, with one of them even featuring Mario enemies. Hunter is an attempt to port the game of the same name released for the Amiga and Atari ST in 1991. Well, at least the game's overworld has been ported. And comparing it to the original game despite my limited knowledge, it's actually a decently faithful port with clever use of differing and shaded polygons, which is a rare sight on the Virtual Boy. I'm not sure how much of the original game's mechanics are present here, but you can walk, swim, drive around in a car, and drop bombs. It seems to crash on occasion though, which is a minor shame. Flappy Cheap Cheap Yep, that's what it is. It's about time you showed up, Pop. You're the only hope for our world. Star Fox is a one-man tech demo that tries to replicate the on-rail shooter experience using a similar wireframe rendering tech that powered games such as Red Alarm. It's pretty simple, but it holds some potential, seeing there haven't been a whole lot of homebrew games that have gone full 3D. VB Racing is an OutRun-style racing game demo, and it just dawned on me that we haven't actually seen any sort of racing game officially released on the Virtual Boy. There was a sequel to F-Zero planned and possibly completed, but it never released. This, on the other hand, is more reminiscent of the overhead racing games commonly seen on the NES in the 80s. And it pulls off the effects surprisingly well, with very smooth motion, large depth of field, and even three-dimensional car sprites. A small scale but highly polished demo, which is impressive for a title made in 2008. Next up, we have a Mario Kart game. Let's see how this fares. Was that the name of the game? Okay. This is only a basic demo, so you can only play single-player time trials without any items, so it's not really Mario Kart, but still, this game features a nice replication of the Mode 7 style scrolling seen in the original game. My only complaint is that the simplistic 2D pixel sprites don't lend themselves well to being converted to 3D instead of remaining as flat sprites. And while this is from a time when coding for the Virtual Boy sound hardware was still a little mystifying, the music could use some further workshopping. Uh, what's next? Uh, Virtual E.T. I'll just say what a fitting combo. Snatcher Act 1 is a port of the opening section of Snatcher, one of Hideo Kojima's earliest projects just following the first Metal Gear game. Interesting to see a visual novel style game on a Virtual Boy, but it is a faithful port with the dialogue system remaining intact and having all visuals converted into 3D. It was actually created in memory of a member of the Virtual Boy homebrew community who planned to create a port of the game, but unfortunately passed away. 
I think they would have loved to see this. We've been seeing quite a few ports of existing games onto the Virtual Boy, but this is probably the most complete and impressive port we've seen yet. Hyper Fighting is one of the most well-known pieces of Virtual Boy homebrew, being what is essentially a feature-complete port of Street Fighter 2, at least one of its many incarnations. 12 playable fighters, multiple stages, 4 game modes, you name it. It even supports the unreleased Virtual Boy Link cable for 2-player versus matches. Gameplay-wise, it's Street Fighter 2, lovingly rendered in red and black 3D. I'm obviously not the most skilled fighting game player out there, but I can still marvel at the polish that's clearly present here. With the scrolling 3D backgrounds, detailed pixel art, and the well-known sound bites all transplanted over. It definitely qualifies as a professional release, and is actually part of the Hyper Flash 32's namesake, being the first Virtual Boy flashcard that can support its 32 megabit ROM size. As you can imagine, ways to play this game on actual hardware are a bit pricey to come by normally, so this flashcard really is a pretty good investment for Virtual Boy enthusiasts. Next up, we have some homebrew games that were made using VU Engine, an effort by members of the homebrew community to create an open source game engine for the Virtual Boy. This game here is a single-level platformer demo with some Wario Land vibes, mainly being that you can explore to collect items and go into the background. Mechanics-wise, it's pretty simple, but otherwise the presentation looks pretty solid. Of course, besides this, there are also a handful of other demos being made to demonstrate this engine, and I can't possibly talk about them all here. There is this curious little thing though, VUE Master, a clever spin on the View Master that lets you view 3D photographs on the Virtual Boy. I'll be honest, seeing photos rendered in the Virtual Boy's red and black style with Devering is a pretty cool effect. Alright, last but not least, let's end things off with a Game Boy emulator. Yes, you heard that right. By using a specialized program, you can compile several Game Boy games into a ROM that fits on the Virtual Boy. But that's basically what you get, Game Boy games running on the Virtual Boy with half-decent sound emulation. It's more so a technically impressive feat than an ideal way to actually play these games. Also, despite what this emulator within an emulator footage may lead you to believe, the actual hardware does chug a little bit trying to run some of the more complex Game Boy games. Yeah, just stick to Tetris or something. But I think they'll do it, that is enough homebrew for one video. There are a lot more titles that I didn't cover, but let's get back to the main topic. While Virtual Boy emulation has certainly been getting more refined in the past few years, including people who have managed to use it with modern VR headsets, there is still a sizable group that likes playing both its increasingly inaccessible retail library and modern community creations on the original gimmick hardware it was designed for. And the Hyper Flash 32 was another step towards making that process more convenient, while also being a super creative piece of engineering in its own right. It is absolutely a great piece to have for any Virtual Boy owner. As for the average Nintendo fan, you might want to consider a little more before potentially dropping big bucks on both this and a Virtual Boy to play games on. But looking at the current market for retail games and the potential of the homebrew community, this is probably not the worst investment in the world. 3D Virtual Boy emulation on the 3DS still has a long way to go, and I still stand by that trying an actual Virtual Boy should be on any Nintendo fan's bucket list. So maybe this weird little flash card with a built-in screen could be something that's up your alley. I mean, hey, worst case scenario, you have the cartridge but not the system, you still got yourself one of the world's smallest EN canvases.